my wife was invited to talk at some meeting decades ago, and the topic was uh, the 16th, 16th dynasty in ancient Egypt. And she was, you know, saw this announcement and she was thrilled, and then she discovered she was the one speaking. And this is no good because nobody knows anything about the 16th dynasty. So, you know, depends on which child turned out to be the 18th. She does know something about that. Um, I, I look around the room and I see people, you know, why don't one of you talk? You probably have something to say. <laughs> That's probably true. Do I have to repeat all those remarks verbatim? <laughs> okay, so for the record, there was a bad joke, and now we get on with it. <laughs> so the, to the uh, topic I gave Denison said as little as I could think how to say, cryptography and computer security, the view from 2016. Which means I you know, give you as much as I can get away with of how we got here, and a little bit about where we are, and a little bit about where, where we're going. So that's... Anyone who wants to walk out can get a head start on the mob. Um, you know, cryptography originates in two places. With Al-Kindi, about 200 AH in Baghdad, and with Alberti, Porta, and some other people, about 1500 AD in Rome. And there's lots of detail to that, but from a cryptographic, not cryptanalytic point of view, it comes sort of up to two Two, two things. Right? They figured out that what was wrong with what they knew how to do is that you get to see the same construction in too many different contexts. If you're substituting, you know, if you replace H with Q and then you see the ciphertext of the words T-H-E and W-H-O and, and so forth, you get to see, get several views of it. That's called depth and that allows you to, to recover what the substitution was. And then this was all analyzed to death, you know, in 1945 and 1949 by, uh, by Shannon. And it's a very famous part of, of cryptography. And what they figured out was <coughs> that the main thing that came out of those things was what's called a polyalphabetic cipher. That is to say, you change the way in which you encrypt with every character that you encrypt. So people don't get to get a real good look at it. And as you know, that is cooked down in the current form in which you, you know, add, add a bit to each bit that you're sending and either flip it or don't with a 50% possibility. Um, but the way they, the critical point in my mind is you can make a reasonable argument that symmetric cryptography has not changed in 500 years. Ours Hours coming from the European tradition. The, uh, the Baghdad papers seem to have been lost until sometime in the last 20 years or so they're discovered, and al is getting a lot more credit these days. But um, homework problem. Anyone who can trace a connection, presumably via the Crusades, from Middle Eastern cryptography to European cryptography would have a, a very good thesis topic. So it had, you know, basically all the systems have two things. They have table lookup and they have some kind of arithmetic. So in some sense, what's called a visionaire cipher, visionaire wasn't really the inventor, visionaire was the VP of marketing, but he got his name on the cipher. Um, what is called a visionaire cipher, which goes along with a sequence of cipher alphabets, I look up tables and goes around in a ring uh, of some length or other, substituting for characters, is, except for size and complexity, the same thing as the advanced encryption standard. Right? Or has built on the same principles. Advanced encryption standard has a, has a lookup table. It's a bit larger. It has some underlying fancier mathematics. It was thought up by Kaiser Nyborg in, uh, in Finland. And it has arithmetic, in this case is the arithmetic of Galois fields and some simple sort of XOR arithmetic. But there's not a huge amount new under the sun. It just took a lot of time to get to it. And the other point is nobody can do those visionary type things very well by hand. So in principle, you can build a secure one, but you have to do it several times. And if you try to do it several times by hand, you make some efficient number of mistakes because you never get any messages through. 
So until the era of good enough machining to make mechanical and electromechanical devices that did it, there wasn't much action in that direction. The other possibility is to encrypt more stuff at the time. So you back, grab a big chunk of it. Now there are a couple possibilities about that. Right? The one that got used for 500 years are called codes. You pick the objects that are significant, and you have possibly, I think there was US code with 100,000 main entries. So it's somewhat like a normal dictionary of English. And you substitute things. And now you have analyses you can do about how long you can use it before you've done it too much, and you ought to change it, and things of that kind. Um, and that governed cryptography up until two great events of early 20th century. First is the invention of radio. It's early 1903 when the first transatlantic radio message is sent. And that just changed everything. All of a sudden, there was this wonderful thing that nobody could plan to stay in business and refuse to use that was pretty much open to everybody listening to it. You know, 11 years later, they start fighting their next big war. And it's the first war fought in the era of radio. And it just bypassed all of the information security technology of the 19th century. And they knew how to lock their safes and guard their offices and things like that. And now all of a sudden, there's this transmission. The only thing you have is cryptography. And it had two properties. It wasn't very, very secure, and it wasn't very fast, but it was all they had. And so they, they did that. And the inventors got started working. And the inventors came up with a couple of different things. The most famous one is called rotor machines. And the first solid rotor invention is in Oakland, a man named Hebern. Um, Shortly after that are people named Ser Ser Serbius and Dam uh, who laid the foundation for the most famous Enigma machine uh, called, famous rotor machine called the Enigma. Um, and that was sort of the backbone of World War II cryptography. Lots of other things were done, but lots and lots of traffic was sent in, in, in rotor machines. It's not if you're counting you know, how much cryptography is, you can count three things. How many pieces of equipment, how much money was spent for them, or how much traffic was processed. They aren't always the same thing. And then, of course, the deal is queered a little bit by trying to figure out how to compare two things, one of which is more secure than the other one. So at one time, you know, one time the Zenith TV scrambler was the most widespread cryptographic device in the world, if you want to count it as a cryptographic device. Somebody reasonably snotty might not. Today, uh, it's SSL in the browsers. As far as I, I can't find anything for which I find a larger number count, and it must compete pretty well on number of bits shipped. I don't know about total cost. So the, that technology, these rotor systems, probably the fanciest of them is an American device called Sagaba, which has 10 rotors, but they don't all process traffic. Five of them tell the other five rotors how to move. Anybody doesn't know, a rotor machine does index table lookups. You have instructions on some machines we've had around here that, that do this. Uh, you have a table, and you, know, you have an indirect address through the table, and you have a, an index. And so what the rotor machine does is just change its index from one character to the other. It changes the indexes, and it keeps looking things up in the tables. Well, Sagaba had one rotor machine that tells the other rotor machine how to move. A lot more complex. And Enigma had a, had a one-up counter, like a, an odometer counter. Um, but all of this has a very serious, some very serious disadvantages. One is, of course, rather slow. Right? 10, later maybe 15 characters a second. That's, that's just fine. You know, that was the speed of teletypes at that time. But voice is a minimum of 120 characters a second formulated that way. And so what happened that was tremendously important, and very, ha, this one's going to rank high in money, low in traffic, total traffic volume, 
and in uh, though fairly high for the data rate and low in the number of machines. And it's called Sig Sally. And Sig Sally was a, a secure telephone in remarkably similar to a current secure telephone that will fit on your desk, except they had occupied a room this size. It occupied 37 foot tall racks of equipment, it weighed about 30 tons, and it probably cost about as many million dollars. And initially, there were just a couple of them. They only, only Churchill and Roosevelt could afford them. Right, there was one for the cabinet war rooms, except it was in the basement of the uh, Selfridges in London. And there was another one somewhere in Washington. I don't think it was in the White House. Um, and these things had most of it. Of course, the crypto system is rather simple. Crypto system is what's called one time. You have a 16 inch, which is the professional standard, long playing record. And it has binary information on it. And it XORs bits with the, with the plain text. And at the end of the conversation, the code clerk smashed the record so it can't accidentally be used again. Um, but most of it's a vocoder, right? So a vocoder that now, of course, goes on a chip at that time occupied most of 30 racks of equipment. Well, that wasn't, eventually all the four-star generals jumped up and down, demanded one. There were a dozen or so at the end of the 40s. But what this did was show everybody the prospect of a new way of communicating. And that's, that's, I think that's one of the dominant things. If you look at this and look at some of the later cases, that the important thing is people want to communicate in modes that are made attractive by other things. In voice, in TV, in, in email, in Facebook. You get constructions that you didn't have before. Eventually it's going to dominate uh, virtual reality. And so the 50s, one side of the 50s in cryptography was dominated with producing faster and faster devices that are what are called long cycle systems. You have something of known period, typically a shift register, and then you do something to make the output of that register nonlinear. And there are two possibilities, and you can either, you have what's called a combiner, you have an end to one function, uh, that produces outputs that combine places in the shift register, uh, or you have, you apply your combiner as a predicate and use it to stutter the shift register. So the shift register moves an irregular number of places. Just in sense, that's overall, that produces a better sequence, but on the other hand, has the big disadvantage that somebody might detect that you're doing more work to produce some bits than others. Paul Kocher, who came out of this the school figured that one out in a more modern context, and what's called differential power analysis, something like that. Um, now, to my mind, the most interesting thing that happened in the early 50s is very separate. There was a project, see, I don't know what you guys know about radar. Radar was largely developed at MIT in what's called the Radiation Laboratory, intentionally misleadingly named in World War II. Uh, it was what was, in my era, it was Building 20. But the Radiation Laboratory itself closed, I think, in September 45. But in some sense, it was moved a block or two. Uh, something that the Air Force Cambridge Research Center opened. And it didn't have as many people. Some people found other jobs. But it went on then for another 30 years. And it played the initial role in what was called SAGE, the semi-automatic ground environment, which automated the activities of, of people who sat on radars and looked for airplanes and called up anti-aircraft guns and said, said, shoot at that thing. And that's very hard to do by hand for something the size of the United States, try to watch, see that anything's coming in. And so SAGE was a major a major business, one could say, I mean, there's no one, of course, it was never tried, right? It, never, it was never used in anger. Nobody ever attacked us with conventional aircraft over those routes. And so nobody knows whether it worked or not. Well, Tech Santa Claus. <laughs> <laughs> I have to weigh that. I thought it was NORAD, a later system that detected Santa Claus. I thought Santa Claus had too much stealth to be found by Sage, but. Uh, <laughs> Um, <laughs> I thought he traveled at a hypersonic velocity. Uh, 
<laughs> well, maybe, and maybe, you know, well, yes, we detected it. It just happens to be in the next room by now. <laughs> um, so any of it. Um, and one interesting thing I learned from studying the history of this is this is what made IBM. You know, I didn't understand at the time that the IBM 704, 709, 7090 were all built basically for this project. Let's go a little further back. This is wonderful. I mean, all the computers built up to that time, things like the Joniac and the Maniac and so forth, were all meant used for scientific calculation. Uh, for example, they did the H-bomb calculations on some of these machines. And they did them by checkpointing every eight hours onto cards. So the thing ran for months working on this calculation. Right? Uh, but it didn't have to be reliable. Right? You mostly lose on average, four hours work. If it breaks at some point, you fix it, you load from the previous cards, and you start again. Well, a guy named Forrester at MIT had this dream of using it for things like air traffic control. And so he needed his machine to be reliable. Okay. And that turned out, one, that was really expensive. Things were literally gold-plated, right? less corrosion. And he was about to get his ass thrown right out. Right? When somebody who's named slipped my mind at the moment, basically from the Air Force, came along and was looking for, you know, had this notion of air defense, and as the book put it, and suddenly the objective changed from avoiding air collisions to arranging them. <laughs> <laughs> and that was a much more profitable business, and IBM was the one company that showed enthusiasm for this, and it paid for the cost of generating the first big, you know, the generation, the, the thing that made IBM the company with more than half the market. Well, at AFCRC, there were two products, projects, and I can't get them entirely sorted out yet. The one is a data link project, because there are, you know, modems weren't then what they are now. And, uh, there were radars out somewhere, and there were big computers somewhere, and there's a, a fan-like network bringing data into the computers, and it has to be transmitted somehow. And some of it comes from aircraft, some of it goes to aircraft, some, lots of it comes from ground radars, and so they needed, I call it, call it, I think we call it a modem, but they call it data link, and those terms still used in the military. The system's called some of the data link 11, data link 16, I think, are big things now. The other one is the identification friend or foe problem. World War II, and into after World War II, you know, you have a, a fire control radar sees an aircraft and sends a message saying, you know, respond correctly or I'm, I'm going to tell the gun to shoot at you. And all of that in World War II was done by uh, analog techniques, delay lines, and you have a, you change the signal and you, shuffle it around by delaying different pieces of it different amounts of time. Just incidentally, 2.9 microseconds is a very important unit in those delay lines. That's because an order was sent out in 42 or 43 for three microseconds, and it came back and it was wrong. It was 2.9, and there wasn't time to make them do it over again. And so we're still, we still have 2.9 microseconds. We probably have more serious legacy problems in our technology. Um, at any event, Horst Tristel worked for one of these groups, and I'm not perfectly clear at this point which. Um, and Horst, he had immigrated from Germany in the mid-30s, went to MIT, and then he went to Harvard. And he, in January 30, oh yeah, he was about to become a citizen when the war started. And uh, so he was put under house arrest, and that, not literally, but if he went to, uh, went to, to New York, from Boston to New York to see his aunt. He had to tell his case officer and things like that. And then January 31st, uh, 1944, I think, he got his American citizenship. And the next day, he got his top secret clearance, and he went to work at the radiation lab. Uh, I, they've been watching him. Uh, and. He had never been interested in, since he was a child in much, I mean, he actually majored in physics, but he was really interested in cryptography. And he says, people at the lab said to him during the war, it's not the time for a German to be talking about cryptography, Horst. But after the war, he discovered a system. I think he must have been in the data link group. And he discovered a system moving through the IFF group. 
and what back to gross history, what evolved, there are two aspects of digital IFF. One is a thing that's now ubiquitous you used around the world called the Mark 10. So Mark 9 is the last analog, and the Mark 10 is a digital one, sends back, you know, you get challenged by the radar, you send back a number. In the case of civilian aircraft, this is just basically some, something, loosely speaking, the flight number. Maybe more to it than that, but not much. The Mark 12 made arrangement for encrypting that. And so in comes a 32-bit challenge, and back goes four bytes or something uh, of, of encrypted, encrypted challenge. Incident, the formats are funny, and I'm not perfectly clear. I need to study a bit to know how to translate them into modern data terms. Um, so don't, don't take those numbers too seriously. Um, but you can't do that with a long cycle system. It has no intersymbol dependence, right? It always en encrypts the same thing the same way, or you have to add a large indicator or something like that. You need something that encrypts a block of digits. And they began working on that problem. And somebody had designed a system, and Horst just was incensed that it hadn't been adequately eval evaluated. And his group got their hands on it, and worked, and sure enough, they broke it. And it was debugged by a number of people, and then they broke it again. And that uh, hadn't been fielded yet, but it had been, it was just on the verge of being adopted formally for this purpose. Eventually, that system was developed. It's called Cadmus. I don't know if that exact one is still in use in the IF devices. There was another one later called Masker. But the that is now at the root of, in particular, the, the first US public cryptographic system, the US data encryption standard. Horst Feistel basically had people to support him for a while. I mean, the, that lab at AFCRC closed. He went to Lincoln Labs and, um, I say Siegfried, but that's not his name. Um, <laughs> Uh, same as the department store in uh, London. Uh, no, other one. Selfridge. Selfridge. All of us, all of us Selfridge supported him for a while at, uh, at uh, Lincoln Lab, and then he went to MITRE, and he was there for a little while, and he got sh his crypto work got shut down. Then he went to IBM, which, you know, for whom the government was merely, was not their owner, so to speak. It was merely a good customer. And beginning in the late 60s, 66, 67 or so at IBM, he began working on cryptography again and recycled a whole lot of the early stuff from 20 years before. And produced first uh, the output of that, the important output. There are two things. There's a system commonly called Lucifer. It's not clear what its formal name is. Um, it went, is a component of something called the IBM 2984. Uh, it's a 32-bit system with a 64-bit key, and it was used in banking. And when 1975 uh, data encryption standard was proposed, it's a 64-bit block system with a 56-bit key, and it was adopted two years later, and, and the first earlier system was replaced in most of the IBM equipment, and that system became very important. And that system was the center of a fight for which I am you know, very grateful. Um, uh, one of the yuppies... Uh, Said, Yippie said, uh, don't speak ill of the police. The police legitimize the demonstration. Uh, and that was kind of how it, there was a big fight that started over on Welsh Road uh, due to Paul Barron, who's the true inventor of the internet. Uh, he was the host. And it, among other things, there were a number of IEEE topics on the table, but one, one was added about, about whether to take a position on DES, which was then a year or so the proposal was a year or so old, and suddenly the meeting was enhanced. Previously, the longest traveling person came from LA. Suddenly, three guys showed up from Washington. Um, and they were Denny Branstad, whom some of you probably know. You may not know the other two, who are Doug Hogan, who has died, and uh, Arthur Levinson, who was a, a great shining light 
at, at NSA. He worked at Bletchley Park. He went around the continent collecting, Brit collecting German cryptographic equipment and some cryptographers after the war, uh, things like that. At any event, uh, there started at that meeting an argument, and I've been, I say, I'm very grateful. I've been making a living off this argument for 40 years now, um, this spring. Uh, Marty had, I had proposed, I said, you know, 56 bits is not enough. That's just a billion billion. I did some calculations. You know, with this, it's possible to break. Not say it's cheap. Uh, I had probably too high an estimate. It's possible to break it. You shouldn't adopt anything that you think it's possible to break. And Marty worked on this, and he cooked this estimate down, and he wrote a paper, it's mostly him, about how it can be done in silicon on sapphire, which has been forgotten, and I don't remember whether it was CMOS or bipolar or what, but it didn't even got, got the cost estimate down to about 20 million bucks to do it in a day, which may be a little optimistic for that period. Um, and Arthur Levinson, Arthur Levinson was really sarcastic about his design. And I've got to see the basic thing here. This is a, Arthur Levinson's a Brooklyn boy. Marty Hellman, he's a Bronx boy. You don't talk, you know. One doesn't talk to the other this way. So we got, you know, this fight went on for a while. We lost it in a tactical sense. I can't figure out now whether we were right or not. I mean, DES, what's called single DES, that system was in, stayed in use till 1991, I think is the first time it began to be, mo be modified. Eventually, by, two, by going on to 2000, it was, quote, triple DES. You do it three times in a row with, with either two or three different keys. and you know, it's not actually it's still in use, of course. Uh, nothing ever goes away in cryptography. I mean, I almost guarantee you somebody used an Enigma machine in anger in the world in the last 24 hours. <laughs> I don't know who it was, right? But I think there's a good chance of that. Um, the last, I mean, the last uh, Enigma problem NSA will admit to having worked was against the Stasi in about 1960, early 60s, one of the early 60s, yes. Uh, so things, things just go on, and somebody, I mean, there's some really dreadful machine from the 20s, and somebody was still selling it a few years ago. I mean, it's, you got, you got this kind of thing. So um, in the late 90s, uh, uh, National Bureau of, well, National Institute for Standards and Technology by then, undertook another development of a symmetric algorithm in cryptography Gave it the wonderful name, you know, <laughs> where they hire these guys, the Advanced Encryption Standard. Um, and, but they did it the right way. They did it by an international contest. Right? There was a set of requirements, a bunch of hurdles you had to jump to keep you from just sitting down for one evening and scribbling something down and setting it in. They accepted 15 submissions. They stewed over them for about two years with three international con conferences and criticism by the public community. 30 NSA people came to the first conference. Fewer came to the later conferences. Um, NSA assigned both ComSec people and SIGINT people to it. Uh, so it's pre before its release, I don't know if it's the most carefully evaluated system of all time, but it's the got the most pre-release evaluation of any system. And it was signed by the Secretary of Commerce in November uh, 2001 and is still in use and will be in use, you know, I might estimate for an indefinite period of time. Uh, and as I say, it's a vastly, you know, a vastly refined version of the things whose principles were set down in 1500. Well, now I've skipped over the part that brought me here, right? <clears throat> the most sensitive operation in all crypto security is key management. If you can, starts with the manufacture of keys. If you can manufacture good keys, you can have secure cryptography. You might have to manufacture a lot of key. You use what's called one-time material. You print giant books of it. You tear out the pages and incinerate them and all that. But it is logically possible to have secure cryptography if you can make secure keys. And if you can't, there is no possibility of it. And there are some real breaks in our own literature. Uh, in the early 90s, 
SSL from certain machines was broken because you could predict the random numbers that the, uh, that the client was going to produce. Server was usually somewhat better than that. So then what do you do with the keys? Well, if you're a, a tightly integrated organization like DO, DOD, then there's something you can do. Because DOD is interesting. DOD is a rather large organization. It has more than a million employees. But everybody knows the chain of command. Right? It goes to the president, to the secretary of defense, to the, to the chairman of the joint chiefs, to the four stars, you know, and on down to peoples with rifles in, in foxholes. <clears throat> that gives it the blessing of being able to appoint, quote, the executive agent for communication security. That, of course, is NSA. Right? So you have this huge organization the church the trusts a small part of a smaller organization to manufacture all the keying material and ship it out to everybody. Now, if you think about the internet, that's just absolutely a non-starter. Right? There is nobody, maybe nobody anybody trusts, but nobody that everybody trusts on the internet. Because all classic military networks are meant to friends to talk to each other. Right? Look at something, you know, modern like CIPRNET, Secret Internet Protocol Router Network. That's, it's all people who have secret clearances, who operate cleared facilities, operate approved terminals, all of that. But the internet is meant for everybody to talk to everybody else. And consequently, um, you can't have any one agent to, to do this sort of thing. And you would really, you know, your, your prospects would be very limited if you had to do it that way. And that's, a, that's what led me and me and Marty uh, and independently Ralph Merkel and independently some people at GCHQ to think about this problem of how do you arrange, you know, you and I want to talk, how do we arrange common keys? Or the other problem, and I, this is, I mean, I don't know, think, I think God makes this up as we go along, right? Uh, I had been thinking about two problems. I began thinking about how you arrange keys in 1965 because some friend of mine told me that the NSA encrypted the telephones inside its own building. And I was too anti-societal to understand, you know, from an organizational point of view, it would do perfectly fine to go around, you know, you'd improve things by going around plugging keys into the phones. Whole building, everybody has top secret clearances anyway. It would mean that somebody were able to intercept the traffic for some reason, they'd have a lot of trouble reading it. But my notion of a secure phone call was, you know, you call somebody and you can understand it and they can understand it. And nobody else in the world can possibly understand it. So the notion that somebody would have manufactured the key and delivered it to you, that, that was just a non-starter in my view. Well, 1970, I got to Stanford and John McCarthy went off to a conference in Bordeaux and talked about uh, internet commerce. Well, I didn't call it that then. He called it buying and selling through home terminals. And he had in mind something like what I mentioned he emerged in France a few years later as the Minitel. Right? But that got me thinking about automated offices. And my notion, you know, what do you do for the signature in an automated office? Because signatures on paper depend on their uniqueness. It's very hard to reproduce one. But digital documents can be copied bit for bit exactly. Right? So I'd been worrying about two problems when in 1975 I found the answer to two of them in one, one package. Right? And this is what we call public key cryptography. The, the, then, of course, the solution diversifies out around the problems. And some things do key negotiation better. Some things do signature better, et cetera. Um, but that is what gave rise fundamentally. You know, there's an argument about DES, but we've moved now, and I'll get back to this, into an era of arguing, you know, what do you do if you have really secure cryptography? Because a lot of people in society think they're entitled to spy on everybody. And that's only going to get worse. So let's see what I get to next. Uh, OK. So, let me just describe the pre-battles briefly about this. In starting essentially with our work in the, but to some extent also with Feistel and IBM's work in the 70s, 
NSA suddenly had a rude shock of exactly the kind that anybody thinks he owns a market has. What? This is our market. What are other people doing? They're not supposed to be here. Right? And it began trying to, it had one set of laws that was very significant that affected this. That's export control. Export control was designed post-World War II. Its application to cryptography combination of law and regulation was written in the late 40s when one, the US was good for most of the world's economy. Right? It had lent, you know, either blown up the rest of the world's economy or lent the money to other people to blow it up. So we were a very large part of the manufacturing in the world. Two, cryptography was a very small part of commercial activity. Oil companies used it a bit and banks used it a bit and that, you know, there wasn't that as far as it was it when I got into this field uh, circa 1970. Those were the main users. And so there was no great inconvenience to American companies when they couldn't export cryptography. They didn't make much of it anyway. Uh, once it began to become important, that of course was a very useful tool for the government in limiting commercial production of cryptography. The, they tried, they didn't like, they didn't, they didn't just, however, they didn't just dislike cryptographic production, they didn't like uh, cryptographic publication. So what people usually don't ignore, people, what Marty calls first crypto war is about the right to, to study and publish and develop cryptography in the public world. And that one was sort of won. The only real obvious battle is in 1980. Uh, Bobby Inman, who was head of NSA, appointed a group from the American, American Committee on Education, who, American Committee on Education, who uh, was supposed to bring back a report favorable to his getting a law, kind of like the Atomic Energy Act, which would declare that cryptographic facts were born secret and so forth. And the, the group produced a, a very negative report with an even more negative uh, dissenting opinion, and that was the end of that. The mid-70s, NSA tried to capture the market in another way, and I, I actually think, I had a wonderful conversation with a childhood friend of Marty's, also in this business, uh, I don't see here, is he? Uh, Tom Burson, from in the mid-70s, mid-70s, mid-80s. and. I said to him, basically, I didn't see how we could win against an organization that was willing to misuse its regulatory authority in support of its marketing. It had introduced what we call type two crypto systems, which weren't good enough for classified traffic, were, going to, were allegedly going to be made, made more widely available, et cetera. Tom looked off into space and he said, I don't think they know much about marketing. And <laughs> 30 years has proven him correct. Huh? Uh, but anyway, they, 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 they ex vastly expanded. The only th sort of really visible thing came out of that is a program called Stu3, which uh, produced half a million, loosely speaking, secure telephones, which was the first the government had significantly had secure telephones. Um, and it's very interesting what happened to that. Uh, I mean, the things, those or their immediate descendants still exist. The critical point was, in the mid-'80s, Office communication was a telephone. A fax ran over a telephone. A modem ran over a telephone. Right? And so if you could secure your telephone, you had your hands on the wasp waist of the problem. That solution stayed perfectly valid. It's merely that communication diversified itself out around the solution. So by 2000 or so, suddenly you, you have all these pagers and mobile phones and ethernet and satellite communications and so forth. Now it's a lot harder to do one thing, particularly if you want to keep it secret. Right? So the, the thing that would, make solve, would solve a lot of the problem is to get it into the mobile telephone standards. And there is some crypto in the mobile telephone standards, but not really the right thing. So if there was some region of a chip that kept getting smaller and smaller that went into Motorola phones and Nokia phones and Apple phones and so forth, uh, that would be good from a security point of view. That is not entirely congenial to everybody and that 
they try, they've done it in other ways, but it's cost them a great deal more money. So the, the second crypto war shaped up in the 90s, and it consisted of two pieces. One is the fight over export control, and the other is the fight over something called key escrow. And both of, at least the latter one particularly is back. Key escrow was the notion the government had the right to read your traffic, so it adopted a federal standard, really strange federal standard. Most federal standards say, you know, either do this and get the following measurements, or do the, like DES, do this exactly this way and it will conform to the standard. This standard said, if we like you, maybe we'll sell you equipment. Call this number. <laughs> and that, that limped along for a little while, and eventually they declassified the cryptographic algorithm used, but by then the smell was so bad that you know, nobody, no, not a very nice algorithm called Skipjack, but nobody much was willing to use it. And um, that, the critical thing was export control, and that collapsed basically because in 2000, a report was written for the European community, totally analogous to what's happening now, um, written by a man named Duncan Campbell on commission to the European Parliament, who reported uh, on a variety of snooping programs. Um, now I, my, my, my senility is getting to me again. I forget the echelon, echelons, right? which is a scheme for sort of separating the sources of material from the characteristics of material. So you get it off the sources, and then you shuffle it to the customers. Um, and that pissed the uh, Europeans off, because the side of the Yanks were spying on them. So suddenly, they wanted to control cryptography less, because they wanted to secure Europe better. That put US manufacturers at a big disadvantage. And the government was under a lot of pressure to let us export stuff. And the export control regulations were, were lax dramatically, and I think basically rather cleverly. The, the problem then didn't recur until these last five years, and both elements of it have occurred. Thanks to Edward Snowden, we have some solid data on who's snooping on whom. Right? And um, thanks to the FBI, we have a loud demand that it ought to be able to spy on any piece of equipment. And these problems are not going to stay won. We may win again this time, but this fight will just go on indefinitely because the, the most, you know, there's no more important fact about the present than that we are doing something we have not done in 5,000 years. 5,000 years ago, we moved into cities. And for the first time, people lived in an environment designed by people. And what had been natural law became matters of human policy. And now we're moving our civilization into, into cyber channels. And therefore, things that were natural law are now matters of policy. So of course, we're going to go fighting about the policy. Well, I've now managed to, you know, like the professors who go really slowly at the beginning of the term, and then they get to the hard material, and they speed up. Now, I, I've managed to, to drag on for a while. Uh, telling you how we got to where we are. Let me say a little bit about where we are, what's going on. Because the most obvious question ought to be, you know, <clears throat> cryptography, prior to something I'll get to, had succeeded. It went, I would say, you know, going from 1915 or so, arguable date of the very first rotor machine, to 2005, the adoption of something called Suite B of cryptographic algorithms by NSA. Suite A were presumably some secret ones. Suite B, a set of public algorithms, they're all in NIST standards publications, that are trusted for all levels of classified traffic. And they forcefully sold them around the world. We'll get back to that point as well, and began to adopt them. And so, in a vague sense, you know, we had. Cryptographers did the same thing that some foolish wolfhound did in Ireland a couple of centuries ago, right? Some, some wolfhound killed the last wolf. That was really bad for job prospects among wolfhounds. Uh, and so you know, I ran into Dickie George, who was the highest placed uh, defensive guy at NSA at the time at the RSA conference. He says, Do you, and I, I had an analogous job. I was chief security officer at Sun Microsystems, and I was concerned with the security of the product line. He was concerned with security in NSA's product line. He says, Do you still do any cryptography? I said, Oh, yes, as much as I can possibly justify. And he looked, you know, looked dreamy and said, Yeah, me too. <laughs> and I realized, you know, well, we are, we're a bunch of old crippies 
trying to pretend we've been recycled as some kind of cyber warriors so that we look relevant. But the trouble is, I mean, so cryptography, cryptographic algorithms look great. Everything from cryptographic implementation to operating systems to hypervisors to apps look dreadful. Right? And so the basically we've moved into a codependence with the with the anti-malware people. The basic problem of computer security was set out about 1970. It's called the confinement problem. I think it ought to be, the, the structure ought to be called a shiroshka. Shiroshka is, is the, the Russian word for a prison laboratory. It's what Solzhenitsyn was in 1949, about which he wrote First Circle. Now, those guys were, devo were developing secure voice for Stalin. It's called secret telephony. And he was going to shoot them if they didn't deliver it in six months in 1949. They actually did deliver something. Those systems, those systems are apparently still on the air. But um, the, uh, the confinement problem is that you want to run a piece of software. You want, you know, maybe you can't guarantee you get useful work out of it, but you want to guarantee it can't hurt you. And all of the early, so we had this fantasy, which is, I think, partly for good reasons and partly for very bad reasons, not been realized, which was you'd have a small part of the computer, it was called the reference monitor, and it would be implemented in a little thing called the security kernel, and it would be proven correct by formal mathematical methods. It turned out that proving things correct was a great deal more difficult, probably a factor of a thousand. Peter back there may know better than I do. But essentially, what's been possible, there are, it, one, the skill base of people who can do it is small, and the amount of it you can do is not terribly large. And so the best people can do is demand the sa either samples or some of the most sensitive code in systems be proven correct. So we now have billions of lines of code and no obvious prospect about how, as how we're going to make them secure. And have sort of given up on the what I consider the first line issue of organizing them so they're secure. The second. Um, the thing about this, however, is the assets have expanded tremendously. So if you think about an old time sharing machine, single, pro single program counter, single memory path, et cetera, running a bunch of people's jobs, you can't, you can't conceal anything from anybody else. It's like a bunch of immigrants, you know, nine of them living in the same room. They can't avoid undressing in front of each other. The next generation, they spread out to nine apartments, they have some privacy. Well. When everybody's in the same run queue, you can hammer on the run queue and signal to people, it turns out, thousands of bits a second. But you get to the point where you can allocate one processor per process, right? then you're in a much better position. And that is plausibly the foundational technique, should be the foundational technique of everything we do, but it isn't. And it takes a while to explain, you know, Efficiency has been pushed ahead of security in that direction. You have, you have multiple processors, but you have various levels of shared caches. You probably don't have enough processors. Um, and so instead, we've turned to a whole bunch of companies, of which the one comes to my mind is FireEye, but it was started by a protege of mine. Uh, and those companies in produce you know virus filters or as FireEye does they run they they run malware in in isolated containers but the cost of the containers is too high for it just to be part of normal software um, and we're not doing so well I think a lot of the problem and I really know what to do about this is that everybody it isn't just the governments the companies want their customers to be secure against everybody but them. And it's not really clear what the alternative is. That is say, you know, I'm not a good enough sysadmin to, man to, to in some way ha manage by hand the updates to my computer and look at the proposed updates and see if they're worth installing and 
audit them to see if they were correctly installed and all of the rest. And if you have the authority to install the updates, then you can install one that, that introduces a keyboard logger, it bugs somebody. Um, and as I say, even and even if you demand, the best you can do that I can see that's not terribly difficult is, and I think the uh, pub, the open source people do a good deal of this, is you have a public bulletin board and you can see that what you downloaded is exactly the same thing that was available to a bunch of other people. As opposed to Apple calls me and sends me something, how am I supposed to know what they sent him? And But even so, of course, <laughs> It's probably formally undecidable whether the update contains the serial number of my computer, and, and uh, as you know, update of fix everybody but him, screw him. <laughs> okay. Um, and I happen to lo I happen I happen to think exemplary is something happened it's now five years ago, RSA security or you know one of the foremost security companies. They make this little widget. Really, I've been saying it was a dumb widget for 30 years, and they've been making money off it for 30 years, so who's dumb? Um, and the little widget you know, exhibits a transient password, and you type that in along with a longer term password. And there are two errors involved here. Somebody got a spreadsheet with a misleading name with some combination of apparently came from internally and was, was sexy, it might tell him his boss's salary or something of that kind. So he opens the spreadsheet, and in fact, what it did was got him by the throat, captured his machine, captured the network, and now we come to the next big era. These idiots who manufacture and sell keying material for a living had it floating free in their network. Right. I mean, by comparison, right, uh, NSA it's moved, but it had a hole in Finksburg, Maryland, 50 feet deep, and that hole um, manufactured key, and o the only NSA people could not freely go into that hole except for the 50 who worked there. So this, you, you must restrict key very carefully, and RSA didn't do it at that time. Um, Somebody at NSA told me, I told sent somebody at NSA, I presume you manufactured your own key for the, for the RSA widgets. He said, no, I don't think so. I think we got it from them. <laughs> I, I, I found that very surprising because they're so proud of their ability to manufacture key. I, somebody failed if they didn't see there was another market into which they could sell key, so to speak. Um, so. Now, I said, you know, cryptographic algorithms are doing pretty well. Well, that was, it's actually been a chink in that armor. And the chink in that armor, and here we get back to the point of NSA, boy, they don't know how to do marketing. NSA, for a decade and a half now, has been marketing the sweet bee of public algorithms to all of its various partners in France. Last summer, it comes out with an announcement. And I don't know who wrote this. It's Trump-esque in its uh, impolitic quality. It says, well, if you've implemented Sweet B, thank you very much. We really appreciate that. But if you didn't, maybe you shouldn't bother, because we're going to have to come out with new quantum computing resistant algorithms. Now, <laughs> now let's get, at some point, you might have to say that. You know, and of course, it's possible NSA knows something they haven't told me. It does happen from time to time. But as far as I can tell, neither we in the public community nor they, you know, know what to do about quantum resistant algorithms. All of the things I know about that are candidates and the three basic schemes are called lattice systems, uh, coding based systems, McAleese type systems, and knapsacks all have gigantic keys. I mean, the millions of bits rather than the hundreds of bits. And that means the whole architecture of things is going to have to be changed. It seems very unlikely that if the problem is solved, that it will be solved by something of anything of comparable efficiency to what we do at the moment. And so we're going to have to go back to caching keys. If you look at secure phones, the, I mentioned the STU3, its predecessor, the STU2, you had to make a phone call to a key distribution center every time you got a key. And so 
they cache it for a day or so in case you call the same person again, which lots of bureaucrats, you know, call the same, same number all, over and over again all day. Well, now we're going to end up, I think, with something potentially like, you know, once a year, you have a five minute or something communication with Amazon and you negotiate a key that you then keep for the rest of the year from which you derive whatever operational keys you have with them. But at any event, um, this whole business is now in a mess. Um, NSA sort of enlarged the sizes of what it has, but nothing is clear about how long certainly the public key component of this is going to be secure. Uh, quantum computing doesn't do very much to the symmetric component. It sort of it sort of cuts certain sorting problems in half. So, you know, key of length two fifty six work factor estimated around one sixty or something. That's perfectly clear. All right, that would be okay. On the other hand, there's every danger that the elliptic curve type systems with keys around three hundred fifty four hundred bits are going to be screwed. And you know, this all depends on the, for, from, on the physicists, right? From the people who brought you the black hole, who knows what to expect. <laughs> How does the Omnibus announce that they are making a 5-qubit uh, quantum computer available for general reuse over the internet? Uh, oh, okay. I'm not sure what a 5-qubit The <laughs> qubit means a quantum bit. It's something that simultaneously occupies all the states between 0 and 1. I don't know. I mean, people keep announcing they can factor the number 15. Uh, I'm not, that, that sounds like five qubits or so to me. I really do. Huh? You get four times four. Right. Uh, so, now, I, I, I've given, I don't try to keep any careful track of how quantum computing is going. Um, you know, invite a physicist over here to, to talk. Now, the other big thing, oh, let me, let me skip forward to what was my point. Um, the big problem has made no progress, in my view, the big problem, which is, you know, I got into this, I thought the same thing every mathematician for several hundred years has thought when he got into cryptography. Boy, this is a mess. I'm going to clean this up. We're going to get, you know, a formal theory. We're going to have proofs of the security of crypto systems. I have this bull about breaking them and so forth. Well, I failed completely. Everybody else has failed completely. The problem is actually fairly simple. Um, in a certain sense, the problem is fairly simple. <clears throat> this is a problem of proving lower bounds and complexity of certain computations. Well, there are lower bounds, solid lower bounds on easy computations like addition. Right. Done, Winston was it? IBM or something. There are lower bounds on some very, very difficult problems, but they're too difficult to be cryptographic problems. Because a cryptographic system cannot be more than NP hard. If you, if you know the key, if you found the answer, then you need to be able to verify it very quickly because you've got to be able to, to encrypt very quickly, right? So the complexity problem that we have is exactly in this PNP range that has resisted, resisted work for more than 50 years now. And um, there's lots of theoretical computer science that claims to be proofs about things in crypto security. And yeah, I don't know, I, I, just, I just don't follow what they're talking about, so to speak. They're basically infinitistic models, asym asymptotic models of some kind or other. And they don't really settle down when there's exactly 300 bits at question what happens. OK. However, the sexier topics. Or I've mentioned quantum computing. The other great thing was discovered here by Craig Gentry a few years ago. It's called homomorphic encryption. And this is, this is a beautiful piece of magic. The notion is, I, I like somewhat extravagant examples, but you know, 40 years ago nearly, there was this rumor, doesn't make any sense, there was this rumor that Soviet agents operating out of some laboratory in Vienna, I forgot it was, were stealing time off the Cray-1 at Yorick, at Warwick, and running, and running uh, nuclear hydro codes. I'm a little skeptical of this. As a friend of mine, Sandia, said, anytime they want to send those codes and those data down here, we'll be happy to run them for one of our best machines. <laughs> but, but maybe, you know, I mean, but it is these days. These days, it is possible to steal computing time on machines fairly profitably. Now, it would be much better, of course, if 
you didn't have to reveal to the machine what you were trying to compute. So the fantasy of homomorphic computing, and it's been done for real in one important case, and the fantasy is you encrypt the data that you want to compute it on, and you send it to a computer that can't understand what it is, but it can compute on it. And it sits and thinks and computes for a while, and then it sends you back the result, which you can't understand. And you couldn't have done the computation, but you can decrypt the result and you can understand it. Now, a guy named Drew Dean, when he went to DARPA, I thought, with a combination of good luck and brilliance, applied this to the most wonderful case. Right, there's a classic ComSec problem called Black Conference Bridge. You have a bunch of secure phones that can talk to each other in pairs quite attractively. But of course, you want to hold a conference. So the classic way to do that is you have what's called a red conference bridge. You have encrypted lines that run to the, to the conference bridge, and the conference bridge is sitting you know, inside a secured facility. And it does all of the mixing and adding up of voice streams and things like that, and re-radiates it out to the people talking. And that has some clear disadvantages because we have to have such a trusted facility. Drew Dean managed to implement a demonstration that used Apple uh, iPhone 5s and uh, Amazon AWS computing and did the black conference bridge in Amazon computing with the conference held among the people with the, with the iPhone 5s. Now, it can by no means be applied to every problem, but that's a real problem. I assume somebody's going to, to quote, productize that because it would really be worthwhile. Um, there was a, at any event, that has proved to be, it's, it's tantalizingly out of reach. Each. It's infinitely better than it might have been. It's nowhere close to being able, you know, there are two kinds of problems in general. I mean, <clears throat> no, there's not quite close to being able to save money doing your nuclear bomb design this way, as opposed to buying more computers. But for certain specialized problems like that, it works. But there's a particular type of specialized problem called private information retrieval that works like this. You know, DHS is looking for a spy in Las Vegas. DHS goes to Las Vegas and says to the hotels, give us all your records. We want to look for a spy. And say, you know, <laughs> have dinner with the king. We, you know, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. We aren't giving you our records. Give us the criteria. We'll run your, nah, we can't give you the criteria. The criteria are classified. Right? So the idea is we may have some scheme that's specialized to this particular case that allows some set of computers to run on the data from the hotels and on the stuff from, from DHS. And you know, neither one can figure out the, nobody can figure out the other people's stuff. Um, I don't know how all that's going. But I have an idea. If you want to submit a paper to a conference, I have an idea of, so to speak, the most marketable paper that one could possibly write at this moment. There are various variations. One of the simplest form seems to me, no homomorphic crypto system could be quantum computing resistant. I have no idea whether that's true or how to prove such a result, right? But, but I mean, you've, there you've got you know, the two sexiest topics in modern uh, <laughs> run together. So I, uh, I don't know how long this runs, but my voice is running out, so I'll, I'll OK, well, I'll, I'll ask for another 10 questions. And since I won't understand the questions, I'll make up. Could you repeat the question, too? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I'll the question. Yeah. I think I'll do people by how I like their look. looks mark up there. <laughs> what can you tell us about the history of permis permissive action links? Oh, okay. hell, lots less than is in print. A permissive action link is a device used to control a nuclear weapon. Um, and the original ones uh, were symmetric keyed. The object is to, you loosely speaking, have cryptographic devices inside the nuclear weapon, which is quite tamper resistant for a variety of reasons, and has a luxurious environment in which to be tamper resistant, because it has power available internally. It right? has all those radioactive things you can take power off of them. Um, just incidentally, I mean, there's a lot of, if you want to know what an HPOM does when it decides it's been tampered with, right? <laughs> you might, really well, you might ask. Um, and the answer, the answer I was given by somebody I, I believe knows things was, the military safety requirement is the response must not propagate outside the weapons case. 
So the requirements of one, it disables itself so it can no longer be used in its intended mode. It disables itself two, so that it no longer will go off as a nuclear device. And then beyond, behind that are concealing design criteria and things of that kind. It's dismantled internally with shape charges, I believe is the main technique. Yes. Um, however, um, there are, the idea is that all of the Cryptographic stuff used involved in arming the weapon is internal to its tamper-resistant shell, and then the permissive action link sends encrypted messages to that. The greatest compliment I've ever been paid in certain ways by a guy named Gustavus J. Simmons, and he was flying to Australia to lecture on uh, nuclear command and control when he read the August 1977 article by uh, Martin Gardner about public key cryptography, and he changed his lectures. <laughs> I thought, uh, that, that, you know, no, I'm not quite done here. At any event, sometime later than that, they will modify, he, he did a huge amount of work at Sandia on uh, public key stuff, and they were changed to be public key, and I don't know anything about them, but I may not be because it's secret. It may just be that I haven't studied it. So is Echelon Sun powered? <laughs> oh, yeah, probably. Uh, he asked um, Scott McNeely, who's my old boss, uh, whether Echelon, that spying system, was sp sun-powered. And I think the answer is in uh, Nikki something's book, Secret Power. There's a beautiful, I, I think she actually has a picture in it. They took through a window of some place in Australia, New Zealand, that's showing sun, sun equipment. Oh, and... Uh, late friend of mine from NSA did some very neat insider trading and walked to his office every morning and go by a loading dock and he'd see how many suns were piled up on the loading dock. So he went, bought sun microsystems and he made a good deal of money. <laughs> by the way, sun, that's not solar, it's the company. <laughs> good, good, good point. And, you know, we unfortunately got absorbed by Oracle before we got into the era of solar power. Okay, you... Okay. So we're in the midst of the third crypto war. Senators Burr and Feinstein have introduced this legislation, which they're just waiting for the next terrorist attack so that they end it. Uh, and then they'll have a terrorist attack if they have to commit it themselves. <laughs> Not commenting on that. But anyway, which they will introduce and they think they will pass, which provides that every device, okay, has to be a, have a backdoor, i.e. It's, 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 it's key escrowed for billions of devices. And now the question is, who holds all those key escrows? And if you look at the current set of candidates for president of the United States, you might worry about who has control of the U.S. surveillance capability. Do you worry more about it than the football? The nuclear codes? <laughs> Equivalent. Um, um, and this, is done. this guy has a really great... Uh, he has something, it, it may fall short as a business plan, but it strikes me as very frightening and that, the, uh, that what they want is the power not just to decrypt things, but to get root access to every device. Thereby, they could bypass, you know, the, your apps run at the, at, the, at the courtesy of the root, and so you can't have an addition, have your own encryption running in an app securely. Very, very interesting idea. I thought, it, well, no, 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 I'm sorry. No, it was not your idea. You, he reports it not as his idea. It's as somebody's idea. But, you know, it's the way I reacted. Uh, there was a, a book about Pearl Harbor in 1967 that said that, um, that purple was made out of uh, stepping, telephone stepping switches. Uh, that idea is too smart for a, for a you know, for a, 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 an intelligent writer to have thought up. That has, that has to be true, and it turned out it was true. So tomorrow there's a uh, Keeping secrets from someone who can read your mind. So maybe there is an answer to this we won't know till tomorrow. Oh, and in this seminar? No, at, at, at Park. At Park, okay. Keeping secrets from somebody who can read your mind. All right. Yeah, that, that's, that's going to become a very, I believe mind reading is going to come along quite quickly. He's not talking about actually reading people's mind. He's talking about in a computer. Oh, I see. Well, okay, well, let me stop for a second and say, you know, I think you're far from safe from having your mind read. People can already tell whether things you're, th you, they show you pictures and they can tell whether the pictures were familiar or not. And I think that kind of thing is going to get better and better. And then I think if certain people become president, 
we have the distinct possibility of bringing three things together I've never heard of brought together. One is some kind of mind re reading. Uh, one, and one is torture. Right? So you basically, you want to torture them and read their minds and, oh, and drugs. Right, so you can, you know, some combination of lie detector and drugs and torture. And I'll bet they'll be working on this wholesale. Alan Gullis did all that. Sorry? Alan Gullis did all that. The there is, there is a new... goes around and comes around. <laughs> there is a new DARPA project for brain implants. Yes. For some allegedly and plausibly very, very good purposes. So, so with, uh, there's been some activity in Europe about uh, banning encryption entirely. Uh, I believe in England and Germany. <coughs> What's going to both be the impact of doing? Well, I'm, I'm, I think there's a definite chance they'll get away with it. No, they won't. They want to ban the encryption. They want to. They want to. They want to have back doors. The, the French and the okay. British li yeah. literature back doors. You well, can encrypt all you okay, want. Okay, from our point of view, banning what we think of as secure encryption. That's right. See, I mean, the big. To my view of this is. That at the moment, we only know how to determine whether immensely simple things are secure. So it's complicating security is sort of the foremost sin in my book. The other thing I believe is that the US critical infrastructure, particularly the electric power grid, are potentially tremendously vulnerable to being brought down and severely damaged by foreign attack. That would not kill a few dozen people in nightclubs. That might kill thousands or millions of people. All right. So if I were organizing the expenditure of resources, that would be way at the top of my list for getting things secured so that they couldn't be broken into. And one of the foremost requirements would be you wouldn't go messing with things. If you think about you know, this thing, Diffie-Hellman Key Exchange, another description some ways of what I've been making a living off of for 40 years, establishes a key that only you and I know and nobody else knows it. And so if we use that in a phone call and then we hang up and the key goes away, the accounting is very simple. We firmly believe that the call was not recorded at either, either end. There's no other record of it. If you, quote, escrow the call, right, now the complexity of analyzing what the actual security is is tremendous because you don't know whether or not it went somewhere else. It's much like the difference end-to-end -end encryption has the advantage you don't have to audit all the wires from one place to another. Now auditing the wires is fine if they're all in one building, that's, that's a reasonable technique, but if they go from here to Hong Kong, it's a very dubious idea. In large buildings, no, auditing all the wires is not a very reliable thing. Well, okay. I, I, I sort of believe, actually, all right. I mean, they have secure phone closets at NSA, but uh, they, for all I know, they encrypt things between phone closets or something. They may only, so they only have to audit the, the phone closets. I don't know the answer to that. A couple more questions, okay. Hey, yeah, we need a question from the press. Yes. Put the squeeze on. Identified um, Campbell and his impact with the echelon um, discovery. And weren't you at Lincoln Lab? Were you in part of your career? Did you, Pastor Lincoln, or BBN? No, no, I worked for Meyer. It's maybe the closest. Last year, Campbell said that his source was Oliver Selfridge. Oh, that could well be. I yeah. find that kind of extraordinary. Well, I, you know, I. I don't know whether it's true. I mean, it sounds like the kind of thing somebody might say because Selfridge died about three years ago, so suitable time to, I create a lot of things to people who've died. Um, the message is don't die or you're gonna turn out to be the person who taught me all this stuff that you weren't supposed to tell me. Um, no, I, don't, I do not know the answer, but given what Selfridge was doing by that time of his life, I don't know why he should have known any of that. He was, that late? Um, well, maybe so. Actually, the people dying, is David Kahn still alive? As far as I know. I spoke to him three or four months ago. Yeah, I just tried getting on his website, and it's down. Oh, yeah, and he doesn't answer his email. He had a stroke uh, last summer. I visited him in the fall. Uh, he was, you know, perfectly reasonably lucid, but at the time he was in a wheelchair and had a 24-hour day attendant. So I, I don't know. I, I called him and spoke to him a little while ago, but, uh, well, you want his address? I mean, he lives on, he lives on, on 42nd Street. Huh? Okay. 
Okay, the, the end questions man will ask the last question. Errors. A lattice scheme has been proposed as a scheme that is quantum resistant, has reasonably small keys, has forward security. Had, had megabit public keys, didn't it? No, you, 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 you just use a seed to generate the okay. big matrix. So that, that makes, I think, we should ask an expert. Yeah, he just nodded. Yes. <laughs> so, so it may well be Not that the cryptography and, and, and the same well known expert said to me in a slightly complaining voice the last conference on Monday that cryptography is solved and it's a bit sad and now it's a question of engineering the systems and doing the social engineering of the public keys. Those are the unsolved Okay, it's not McAleese who said this to you, it's somebody else. Somebody else. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, you know, <laughs> I'll close with this. I. I. Robbie, who's a very well-known 20th century physicist, uh, uh, said when he lectured at MIT when I was a, a freshman, that now, I've forgotten who under whom he studied. Possibly Schrodinger? Possibly. Right? And he said, he meant, as a graduate student, his advisor told him that all, all the big problems in physics had been solved. Dirac had found the equation for the electron. We'd have the equation for the proton shortly. And there would be nothing left but the mopping up. And the mopping up has taken a while. Ah. <laughs> uh.